Okay, moving through the Art of the Americas content area, this is um, Screencast Part 2, and we are going to continue our Art of the Americas starting here with the Incans. The Incan culture is really known for their architecture. We're going to see um, quite a few images in the, um, in the set of the Incans, but what we're really going to focus on a lot is their their um, kind of architectural style. It's, it's pretty original and easy to point out for various reasons. The first is their ashlar masonry, which is basically about kind of um, stacking stones to build um, walls or to build um, you know walls of the buildings or like fortress walls or kind of walls that act like fencing or gates. And what is so special about the Ashlar Masonry is they're not just taking these natural stones and kind of stacking them or mortaring them together, but they are carving each and every stone to um, purposely fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. And so this Ashlar Masonry is, um, you know, piece by piece completely um, chiseled and carved so that it fits perfectly together. And then they also work in a way that they accentuate the joints between them. And their Asher masonry fits together so tightly and is so self-supportive that there is no need for any sort of mortar in between the joints. Um, so we're gonna have lots of images that really highlight that um, masonry um, technique. And then the other thing that they're really known for is the overall shape of their architecture that it's kind of like a very subtle trapezoid effect where you're going to have some wider bottoms and getting slightly more narrow as they come um, up to the roof line um, so that's another feature but more so i believe the incans are known for um, the actual um, sites and the environment that they choose to settle in, that they choose to build their villages and their civilizations. Um, it's not just that they're, you know, beautiful and breathtaking, but it's that they are some of the most inaccessible places on earth, completely inhospitable to, you know, the concept of building a village or a community in the spot. But not only do they do it anyways, but they do it with such amazing sophistication and engineering. Um, so for me, the Incans in this entire content area really is uh, one of my favorites. Um, the um, Incan empire stretched from um, Chile to Colombia. So down here on the map in our modern day South America, you can see where this Incan empire stretched on this west coast. Um, and they were really an advanced and organized system that um, really um, built up a lot of road systems that connected all of these different um, that connected all of these different um, villages. And they had this amazing communication network with trade, and they also were known for like their their waterways. Um, they were just, you know, very, very sophisticated. Um, but at the same time, we know that the Incans also had no written language. So a lot of, you know, what we're understanding about this culture and the civilization is definitely been, you know, due to archaeological remains. So getting into some of the Incan images, we, we do have a pretty good variety. Um, we're gonna start with 160. It's called Maiz Cobbs from 1400 to 1533. And what we're looking at is metal, gold and silver alloys to be exact. But what I know AP wants you to um, remember about this piece is this technique. So it's a technique called repoussé. And basically what that is, is about working with flat, sheet metal and then um, hammering it and tapping it and um, you know bending it to turn these flat um, 
sheet metals into you know three-dimensional art forms but also textural art forms so if you look at the texture of the corn and you look at the texture of the husk you know all of that is kind of hammered into these flat pieces of metal and then they're they're kind of um they're warmed and heated so that they can curve and bend and be molded and be shaped into three-dimensional forms um Corn was, of course, a principal food in the Andes, and you know the there were many, many um, ceremonial ways of um, you know kind of blessing your harvest and making sure you have a good crop. And so, in theory, the function of these is they we believe that they were um, kind of like sculptures in the um, you know in the crops and in the garden. And if you look down at the end here, they were probably placed um, on like a tall pole and were um, kind of staked into the ground alongside the plants um, as like kind of a an offering for good luck and a successful harvest. Um, what is kind of specific to this region and this culture is black maize and black maize which is a black corn was very very common in this um, region of Peru and um, it has just a lot to do with the nutrients of the soil and things like that um, so the fact that they used the silver to um, you know and this repousse technique uh, to represent the corn was really quite perfect because when you think about metals and how metals oxidize and how they age the silver metal when it oxidizes meaning when it's exposed to um, you know oxygen for a long period of time it's it begins to tarnish and so it begins to fade from that very clean shiny silver color and begins to tarnish and become um, almost you know smoky grays and blacks and and a little bit kind of a dirtier look, but that was a wonderful and perfect symbolic representation of the black maize. Um, in the Google Slides, I really do um, think that is important for you to click on this link. It is um, just kind of watching a contemporary artist work with this repousse technique. Um, again, I, I do know that that is uh, a heavy focus on this image for um, AP, they do want you to know what repousse is. Um, and if memory serves me correctly, I, I do think this is our only image in all of our 250 images for the entire year um, that is a repousse technique. Our next image is number 162. It's called Ali Tokapu, and it's a tunic. It's from um, 1450 to 1540, and we have camelid fiber on cotton. If you remember, camelids are from the kind of camel, um, llama, alpaca family. Um, so what we're looking at here is a tunic. So a tunic is, um, you know, kind of a long shirt dress kind of thing. And the way that this, I know it just looks like a big rectangle to you, but if you look up here at the top, there is this black, kind of vertical um, slit, and that is where the head will go through. And then up here, um, you might be able to see that the fabric is folded. So this is open, and this is open for the arms to go through. And then from here on down, it is sewn. And then of course down here, it is open for the legs to go through. Um, so that is how it is worn. And um, the composition of the tunic is made from tiny little fabric squares and these tiny little fabric squares are um, basically designed specifically for the person that wears the tunic so they do tell a story they are very symbolic of that individual or the events that are surrounding that individual um, or places or you know big moments in time wearing such an elaborate garment would definitely it was a status symbol so it would definitely indicate their status which is why that these garments these tunics were probably mostly worn by incan rulers um so this was not you know for the commoner um they were 
small woven little squares that then were kind of um, sewn together to create a large piece of fabric. Um, you can see that Inkins really do value um, repetition of pattern and geometric shapes and kind of using these um, geometric shapes as, as symbols, as identity, um, and like I said, uh, specifically like custom made for the individuals that wore them. Um, in terms of elements and principles, really working with, you know, a, um, a restricted color palette, you know, a color family, definitely unity of all these kind of similar pieces coming together to make one larger piece. Um, even though there feels like there's a lot going on, we can see a lot of repetition of pattern. So we do get a sense of rhythm which then allows us to feel like, you know, there is some order to this. There's some harmony and some melody to this, that it's not extremely um, ambiguous and random. Um, it was really impossible to find an example of like an Incan ruler, um, you know, with this uh, attire on because we, we don't have any any evidence of that but i did find a drawing um, of an incan ruler kind of with this traditional tunic and you could see other things would have accompanied the tunic like um, a, a specific headdress um, some sort of kind of um, cape or something and then they would have either like some uh, a staff or some sort of like um, power or authority accessory like a staff or a um, sword or something like that this is an example of it's called a backstrap loom and this is how weavings were made um, for the incan people um, so the one side of the loom would kind of be um, tied around like a tree trunk and then the other side of the loom was wrapped around the woman's back and it was through kind of leaning backwards that you would create the tension of the loom, all of these warp threads, um, create that tension so that you could weave um, on the, to the left and the right. Um, and again, that's how these individual squares were created and then they were all sewn together. Our next image is actually um, an image of the city. It's image 159. It's the city of Cusco, and it's kind of like the um, the city plan or the aerial kind of floor plan per se. Um, and the reason is because again, there's sophistication in building these kind of complexes and their architecture and their their relationship of their architecture with the land is absolutely amazing. And this is just one of their examples. So the city of Cusco was the capital, the historic capital of the Incan empire. And this city, this is kind of like the royal city was from an aerial perspective in the shape of a puma. And so this is the head of the puma and then the body, and then we, we do have a long um, tail that follows. Um, so because it was purposely designed to be in the shape of a puma, it is referred to as Puma City. The head was the actual fortress. Um, so this is where um, you know, the, the Incan ruler would, would reside. Um, and then the heart of the puma was the central square. Um, the belly of the puma was, you know, the um, the plaza. And so, you know, all of this was just kind of part of the big complex that went with, you know, a um, kind of a royal city. Um, the Incans reigned in this area from the 13th through the 16th centuries, of course, until the Spanish conquistadors invaded. Um, and it's known as an axis mundi, which means the center of existence. So this was uh, an important feature for the Incans. Um, and again, a big reason why they chose their environments and they, they chose their habitats for construction um, very particularly. 
The city itself, uh, the city of Cusco, was divided into two sections. You had an upper um, and a lower section. And um, the upper was called Hanan, and the lower was called Harin. And it also, you know, just like many contemporary cities, it kind of mimicked, mimicked their social classes as well. So if you were of an upper social class, you lived on the upper section and um, vice versa. The Incan Empire later was further divided into four quarters, and eventually these four quarters were separately ruled, still within the same empire, but they were divided and, and separately um, ruled and, and were overseen separately. What I also have here are some great pictures of that Ashler masonry that we mentioned in the first slide. So this is a close-up, which I think gives a, a really good visual of how jigsaw puzzled these stones are, which is the important feature. So again, they are they are carved and chiseled to fit together perfectly, one stone to another. But I think the other thing that is really important is um, looking at these stones, and I think up here is a great example. And do you see how the the edges towards the joints kind of curve? You know, they have that curve to them. Well, that is all on purpose. That is all, again, chiseled out that way. Because when you do that, when you round out the stones and then you put them side by side, it really accentuates the joint in between them. It makes the, um, the lines and the edges between them seem a little bit bolder. And again, that was an aesthetic that was absolutely on purpose. So there's a lot of um, thought and a lot of skill and, and a lot of work that went into their Asher masonry. Sometimes um, their actual structures were made of uh, Asher masonry, but also um, just kind of fortress walls as well. This, um, you know, living in Chicago for so long, um, I had access to wonderful museums and our local field museum, which was the Museum of um, Natural History, had a lot of exhibitions and, and exhibits on um, Art of the Americas. And so I just, you know, took a few pictures um, one time I was there and, and added them into some of the slides um, for this content area. But this was just um, showing you the shape of the puma by kind of lighting it up. Um, again, just kind of this aerial plan of the, um, you know, the kingdom and the city of Cusco. And you can see it has a much more elongated tail than our image does, but really in such an amazing, precise uh, puma shape. And then also remembering that there was absolutely no way for um, the Incans to have any sort of aerial perspective or aerial understanding when um, constructing this. So um, remembering that, it's pretty amazing. Okay, image 159. This is Cora Cancha, and it is originally a temple, and then it was converted into um, a church and a convent, um, the convent of Santo Domingo. Um, this is from around 1550 to 1650. We're looking at sandstone, and of course this is in Peru. So originally this structure was um, a temple, and it was the Incan Temple of the Sun. What is original to this is um, the, the areas of the Ashler masonry that form the base of the Santo Domingo convent. So down here, okay, and a little bit in here, this base structure is the original Incan temple. And then once the Spanish came in, um, then this kind of convent was constructed on top of it. And so hopefully you are noticing with the arches and the columns um, and the stucco, 
hopefully you are seeing that European, you know, influence that is now coming and being built upon these Incan ruins. Okay, so we have this blend of culture again happening here. Um, originally, the walls of the temple, so the exterior walls of the temple, um, when it was the Temple of the Sun, was decorated and covered in gold, completely covered in gold, in order to symbolize the sunshine and reflect the sun's rays to create this blinding effect of the sun itself. So if you could imagine that all this Asher masonry was completely covered in gold, and when the sun would be out blaring and hitting these golden metallic walls and reflecting the sun, that it was literally as blinding as the sun itself. Um, and that was, again, on purpose to kind of pay homage to the sun since this was um, their place of worshiping the sun. But when the Spanish came um, and tore down the temple, they also then removed all of the gold and um, melted it down and then, of course, brought it back to the old world um, to sell or to trade. Um, the Incans were known for having many gods, but ultimately they believed that all of their gods derived from the sun. So the sun god was really their main focus and their, their main essence of worship. Um, even though it was the temple of the sun, a lot of their temples also functioned as observatories as well um, to work with a lot of, um, you know, kind of astrological studies to chart the skies um, and to also you know kind of follow the phases of the moon um, this is also a good example we talked about that subtle trapezoidal um, shape that the incans were known for working with and so up here on the structure itself with this asher masonry you can kind of see how that is working it's wider at the base and it becomes more narrow towards the roof but what i also love about the incans is they would they would mimic that trapezoid shape also in their doors and their windows. So this is an example of their door. You can see it also has that taper. But another interesting feature is that they're also known for having these double jams. Okay, that's what this is called. So if you look, you know, this uh, shape right here, right, most doors would just be that and they'd be done with it but then they actually have another kind of framing um, that goes on the inside of that to make it a double jam, like a, a, like a double doorway. And that is also um, something that was ordered by the first Incan emperor that he felt was a symbol of importance. So these were all very um, aesthetically and consciously chosen designs that the Incans felt, um, you know, revered uh, importance and sophistication and kind of originality. The next image is uh, image 159, and these are specifically about Ashler masonry. These are the walls at Saxa Waman. From 1440, it's sandstone and uh, still in Peru. And what this is, is a, it's a complex that was just outside the city of Cusco, um, kind of uh, towards the head of that puma shape. And what we have here are um, um, just walls and walls and walls of that Ashler masonry. And the difference here is that um, if you look at this picture in the bottom right hand corner, you can see the size of the rocks that were used to construct these walls. And the walls are like fortress walls. Um, so you can see compared to um, a human scale, how absolutely large these were. And again, given the concept of Ashler masonry, knowing that they were all kind of cut and chiseled to fit together like puzzle pieces, 
with rounded edges to give <clears throat> really um, clear definition of the edges and the joints. Uh, it's just you know another amazing phenomenon that they were able to construct something like this. Some of the stones weighed up to um, 70 tons, and we know that they were um, pulled from a quarry that was at least you know two miles away. So given all of those circumstances of moving these boulders, um, shaping them, chiseling them, stacking them, and getting them to fit together um, is really just quite a phenomenon. Um, it's a higher elevation up at the top of that puma head. So this area that was being constructed is actually at a higher elevation and would look down onto the city. Um, but a lot of um, scientists and archaeologists kind of get the feeling that this was an area that was under construction. It was never fully finished. Um, therefore, you know, kind of unsure of what the intent and the function of this area was. Um, perhaps it was going to be constructed to be like the new, um, you know, headquarters for the um, royal, um, you know, household, or maybe it was just going to be an expansion of the city itself. Um, but the thoughts is that it was under construction before the Spanish had come in and never gotten quite finished. But just knowing that there's a lot of evidence of um, construction and expansion with um, this Ashler masonry is something to be well noted. Now this area for the Incans is probably the most fascinating. Um, it's probably one of my favorite images in our entire uh, AP Art History curriculum, and it is a seven wonder of the world. So this is image 161. It's Machu Picchu from 1450 to 1550, and now the stone that we're looking at is granite. So compared to sandstone that was um, kind of in the quarry, uh, sandstone is a, is a softer stone. Granite is a very dense, hard, heavy stone. Um, the function of Machu Picchu was actually, it was kind of like a retreat. It was like a, a, a place of holiday, um, specifically for the royalty, but nonetheless, it was a, a village in amongst itself. So people um, had lived there year round, but they were more there to kind of maintain this area and work for, for royalty. Um, and then royalty would kind of come and go and use this as um, just a, a place of kind of retreat and vacation. Um, what is amazing about Machu Picchu, uh, one of the most amazing things is it is the perfect example of constructing very sophisticated villages and civilizations in extremely remote areas, extremely um, difficult to get to, let alone difficult to construct on. Um, this is an area that was a three-day walk from Cusco, um, and it was located within you know, these mountain edges. Um, and so getting there was difficult. But then if you think about bringing in um, granite and, you know, constructing on literally these mountain edges, um, it's just really hard to picture that this was something that was even possible. Um, we again have beautiful and really, really precise examples of Ashler masonry but remember, take note, now we're looking at Ashner Masonry with granite, you know, a dense, hard stone that's much more difficult to um, shape and chisel and cut. And then the roofs of these um, architectural features were a thatched roof. Um, so over here on the left, I have two images. So we have the image of, you know, what it looks like now with um, it just kind of being evidence of the walls and the ruins of this uh, retreat. But then the image below kind of shows you uh, as a recreation what it would look like 
um, as it was functioning and had the thatched roofs and, and all of that. Um, <clears throat> this area had over 200 buildings. Most of them were um, in you know small independent living quarters and houses, but you also of course had um, you know kind of communal buildings like temples. You had the palaces and the living quarters for the royalty. You had the public baths. Um, you had astronomical observatories and lots and lots of gardens as well. Um, all of the architecture in Machu Picchu, um, you know, has that um, subtle trapezoid shape and all of the same characteristics that, you know, all of the Incan architecture has. This image down here at the bottom shows a good example of that trapezoid shape. Again, it not only being a feature of the structure itself, but also then the, the windows and doors would mimic that same shape also. Um, I think what is also extremely unbelievable about Machu Picchu and shows that sophistication of engineering is that they had constructed in this area a bunch of terraces. And so these multi-level terraces, like these stair-stepped terraces, provided a lot um, in terms of, um, you know, the ability to live and cultivate and, um, you know, grow food and to self-sustain um, in this remote and actually extremely hazardous area. Um, because it is mountain, it, every, there's no soil, everything is rock. But what they did, um, here's some really great examples, but what they did is the edges of this mountain, they would build these terraces, so this kind of stair-stepping effect, and then they would fill um, each level with soil, and this is where they would plant their crops. So kind of like a you know, large-scale, um, fancy container gardening um, type of concept. Um, the terraces, though, also allowed for um, drainage, for, you know, water to kind of um, not pile up within the civilizations, but kind of run down the mountainside. And at the same time, uh, watering their crops, but also taking water away from where people were living so there wasn't any sort of flooding. Um, the other systems that they had constructed that just showed their level of ingenuity were kind of like these, um, these you know, ditch and gutter systems that not only, again, um, would collect water and direct it to, you know, other areas that, you know, needed the irrigation, but also it would allow them to collect water and, um, you know, take it away from areas that they didn't want it to flood and pool, but then they would divert it into areas where they did want to collect water. So um, like, you know, some of their baths or collecting water so that they could use it kind of like a well system in order to, you know, water and maintain um, the crops that they were growing on this mountain. So when you look at all of these details of Machu Picchu, and you um, put it into consideration what a remote, inhospitable um, area this was, it is impressive in every single way. On Machu Picchu, um, we talked about there was, you know, other kind of civic buildings and community buildings and temples and things like that. And so this observatory is one of them that is being featured in image 161. Um, just like everything else, it's made of granite. And this observatory is exactly what you think. It was a place that was used to chart the movements of the sun. Um, another term for this observatory was the Temple of the Sun. And the building itself has kind of two main parts. Um, the upper part is this curved enclosure. And here's a, a image show, showing that kind of conical curvature. Um, and up within 
that area there were some small windows again noticing that trapezoidal shape but those windows were um were aligned with um the placements of the windows were aligned and used to calculate certain constellations that were recorded um, and also it was an, an alignment with the June solstice and the phases of the sun during the summer solstice. Um, and then up at the top of the observatory is this um, stone right up here. And this stone is, um, it is a stone that perfectly aligns with the sun at the spring and the autumn equinoxes. And so what happens is this again helps kind of calculate, you know, a calendar system and, um, you know, the patterns of kind of the lunar cycle. But in the spring and the autumn equinoxes, um, that when the sun would stand directly um, over the stone, this pillar that was right here would be in perfect alignment, therefore creating absolutely no shadow whatsoever. And that was how uh, one of the ways that they used to kind of work with their calendars and measure both that spring and autumn equinox. Um, <clears throat> it's um, kind of a stone that was labeled the hitching post of the sun. Um, it was specifically carved uh, for this purpose. And again, it's part of that um, observatory. Okay, so those were all of the images um, for the Incans. And now we're going to get into some other um, kind of American um, native cultures. And uh, we're, they're, they're a little bit smaller, but it just kind of shows the different types of ingenuity and the different types of living systems um, and kind of cultural attributes to other areas in the Americas. So our next is going to focus on the Anasazi and the Anasazi uh, literal translation is ancient ones in the Navajo language. And what they're most famous for and what our images will show us is their pueblos. Their pueblos is, you know, where they live, their homes, and it was composed of all local materials, but the way that they kind of embedded their living quarters with the natural environment. Um, the core of their structures, of their walls, were um, composed of like rubble and mortar, but then they would put up like a veneer um, on the outside of that structure of polished stone. So it looked very, very smooth and very um, kind of um, clean, but that was just the facade of the actual um, structure behind it. Some of these pueblos were very, very tall, reaching five or six stories, you know, kind of like your ancient um, apartment living. Um, and then all of the tall, you know, apartment style pueblos was where, you know, families would reside. But then um, during wake hours, they had these kind of communal livings in front of it. And those were called the plaza. And the plazas were the, the area of the complex that was their religious and social center where they would you know, have a lot of their meals and um, do a lot of their kind of communal type of daily activities. The Anasazi are located in your present day um, southwest. So we're looking at Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah is where you would find this um, tribe of Native Americans. So that brings us to our image, which is 154. These are the Mesa Verde cliff dwellings. It's from Montezuma County in Colorado. And this is from about 450 to 1300. And again, we're looking at sandstone, which is native. So <clears throat> the Pueblos itself were built into the side of a cliff, of a cliff overhang. 
and the pueblos were built um, underneath the overhang and some of these communities would house up to about 250 people. Um, the Anasazi, like, like most um, tribal natives, lived together in clans in small you know villages because that is you know the the phrase it took a village so you need that mutual support um and that kind of community contribution to self-sustain and also for defense um the top ledges kind of like the rooftops of these um pueblos that's they were used to store um you know supplies and you know other things that were needed that were only accessible by ladder. And then we talked about these plaza areas in front of the pueblos. Within the plazas were these pits, and these pits were called kivas. The kivas um, were um, areas that you would, they're kind of like a basement for lack of a better term. And this is where you would get together as, as a small community. They would cook here. So you had pits for fires and there was ledge seating all around. And this is where, again, together you would cook or you would get together for religious ceremonies or for, um, you know, teaching and learning and storytelling. And the way that it worked is, you know, each family was kind of given um, a, a, a room within the pueblos, but then maybe five or six families were um, assigned a kiva. And that's kind of how this system worked. All of their farming was done on the plateau above the cliff overhang. Um, because there were some um, availabilities of soil where vegetation can grow. Um, but when it came to, you know, the actual dwellings, everything had to be imported into the structures, uh, including water um, from the cliffs up above and from the valleys down below. Um, again, I put in here um, and videos that I think are vital to really understanding the function of a lot of these images. While we are in these smaller cultural um, content areas, I know that AP has a heavy, heavy focus on context and function. And that includes, you know, architecture, communal living, but also a lot of the um, artifacts that we have from these cultures, they really want you to be able to talk contextually about how they were used. So I try to incorporate videos that give you a better understanding of the, the function and the use of a lot of these images. So again, um, pulling the links from the Google Slides and taking a moment to watch these short videos is just going to give you an overall better understanding of these images. Our next small little culture is something that, you know, maybe you're not so unfamiliar with, but maybe you didn't realize that. Um, we're going to look at the Mississippian culture and Mississippian art. And these are um, considered Eastern Native Americans, and they were known for their mound building. Um, they would build these really impressive series of earthworks, and that's literally it is what it sounds. They would push and move and reconstruct the earth itself in a multitude of ways. So if you have ever heard of or have ever had the luxury to visit um, Cahokia, Cahokia is one of our largest um, Mississippian uh, mound complexes. And specific to Cahokia, which is not our image, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but um, specific to Cahokia, what these mounds are is kind of ruins and evidence of these impressive city-states um, that were kind of governed by um, this Mississippian culture. Um, and 
This is uh, down here an actual image of um, kind of the ruin of uh, one of the mounds of Cahokia, one of the large mounds that you can visit and they have a lot of um, public information and kind of a visitor center that talks about the Mississippian uh, Native Americans and what this um, preserved area is is all about but then over here to the left is kind of like a reproduction of this large city-state and the mounds here that were used at Cahokia were to kind of bring certain structures and certain buildings amongst the city-state um, on, on a higher plateau on a higher level um, being you know right off of the Mississippi River um, you know, it's very flat on the edge of that river, uh, especially due to flooding. Um, and so they would elevate their important structures, um, not only to, you know, give them more importance, but to also protect it from maybe um, flooding from the river. Um, they also would build these large wooden hinges. So yes, just like a stonehenge, but they were made from large timbers um, as part of some of their ceremonial features within their complexes. Um, but what we're going to be looking at for our um, AP image is image 156 called the Great Serpent Mound. This is located in southern Ohio from around 1070. And even though some of our Mississippian cultures would work with the earth and make these mounds more as an architectural basis, we do have a lot of um, earth mounds that are more kind of like these um, effigy mounds where they take almost like a sculptural shape over you know a long stretch of land and their purpose is very unknown um, we really know that it doesn't have anything to do with architecture per se um, but there are just some theories out there of what they might have been used for we do know that they were not constructed just kind of in in you know one sitting that they were enlarged and added to over time um, so that they you know were changed over the years and through the generations um, some think that some theories out there think that these um, kind of sculptures, these land sculptures, were influenced by um, astrological phenomenon, um, and some specifically think comets, um, and maybe even a, you know, land representation of Halley's Comet in 1066. Um, that is one theory. The interesting thing, though, again, just like our Incans, is we're looking at civilizations that had no way of planning or viewing things from an aerial perspective and you know that's what is so kind of ironic about these sculptures is that um, it appears that they were definitely meant to be viewed aerially um, but yet that was not something that um, they were able to do so um, you know there's other theories about perhaps these were you know sculptures for um, you know, aliens or life forms that, um, you know, lived in the, in the skies and the universe, or perhaps, you know, paying some sort of homage to the gods that are looking down at them. Um, some theories are that it is a representation of the rattlesnake, which is, as, as we have seen, a lot of these um, kind of um, animal forms um, do take the place as like their power figures um, and do kind of have almost, you know, God deity type of representations. So perhaps this serpent mound was their representation of the rattlesnake, which is a symbol in Mississippian kind of iconography um, that, you know, is associated with crop fertility and, um, you know, being able to kind of self-sustain and, and be successful um, the other thing we know though that it's that these this serpent mounds specifically or these type of effigy mounds are also not related at all to a burial ground or a temple 
Um, so we can kind of weed that out. We know it's not architectural. So we're thinking it has to do with something spiritual or astrological. The next portion of our Art of the Americas is focusing more on um, 19th century Native American art. So what we're going to do is kind of skip around um, current day North America, look at some um, artwork from some different regions. But the point of this little section is to um, kind of see how the native culture has dealt with colonization. Um, that's really the point of this series of images coming up. Um, it was kind of that struggle between trying to kind of keep native practices and, and you know, native artisans and history and culture intact, but also knowing that it has now also merged with, you know, European colonists and at the same time how the presence of people from the old world has also changed their motivation for the artwork that they make. And, you know, all of these um, factors, you know, change the art, but at the same time, it, it still is recording history. It's recording, you know, what is happening um, to these civilizations and how they are adapting. Um, so we're going to see a lot of kind of cross-cultural um, materials that are being used, um, materials from trade. Like I said, you're going to see the function and the motivation of some of these artworks are changing. Um, you're going to see the struggle of native artists, you know, trying to adapt adapt their traditional art forms into you know new ways and and um new purposes um and then also kind of like i said working with more uh imports of materials than and straying a little bit from only working with what was native to their environment so that brings us to image 163. It's called a bandolier bag, and it's from um, the Eastern Woodland Lenape tribe from 1850. So again, this is all 19th century artwork. So we're gonna be kind of hovering in these late 1800s. And the material we're looking at is beadwork on leather. And I know that that's pretty amazing if you see that because it kind of just looks like stitches maybe embroidery thread, but really everything you see here are, are tiny, tiny beads, okay? So what we have here is a large, heavily beaded pouch with a slit on top. So this kind of opens up, so it's like a purse, like a pouch, and it is a, kind of like a cross body, um, so it goes over the shoulder across the body is how it's worn. Um, and it hits at hip level. It's constructed um, of leather, but then decorated with um, threads and beads and um, tassels. Um, the origin of this piece, so here's where that, you know, kind of old world meets new world, native meets colonization. The origin of this, this piece was actually just a decorative piece of garment that went with men's outfits. And so this image, I think, um, is kind of a good example of how it was worn as a part of a men's outfit. And originally, it, it didn't have a function. There was no pocket. It was not considered a bag. It was like kind of a status symbol. Um, men would wear um, these you know, across their um, body as as a decorative element to a costume or ceremonial clothing. So it wasn't daily wear, it was, you know, special attire. But once um, colonization happened, they kind of turned into becoming a utilitarian object. And once that started, it was still mostly carried by men. Um, women 
sometimes would carry one, but that was definitely a symbol of prestige. But these bags were then carried by European soldiers and they used it to store their ammunition. So, um, you know, originally it was just a decorative piece of garment for the natives, but then when they were kind of adapted the, by the European soldiers, they became a, a, a functional utilitarian bag that was used to store ammunition. I know it is important to AP for you to know kind of both, um, you know, realms, both aspects and of the history of the bandolier bag. Um, we have a, a merging of materials here because the beadwork is, you know, post-European contact because the beads were glass beads imported from Europe. And then the tassels, the gray and the red tassels at the bottom were made from silk which also was an imported and traded item. Prior to having those imports, these, these were made um, with and, and embellished with quill work, which were um, like the quills of a porcupine. So you would take those quills and you would kind of cut them up into smaller pieces and those would behave as the beads. Um, these bandolier bags are still made and worn today traditionally um, by eastern woodland lenape um, when looking at the patterns the patterns are very symbolic to the eastern woodland um, native people they are extremely intricate patterns and and you know technically skilled really favored symmetry but it is definitely a prairie style pattern because although it's it's very abstract and geometric in nature. They are also abstracted shapes of native flowers, woodland surroundings um, that really kind of showed their, their region, their environment. Um, <clears throat> again, it's an artistic example of people adapting to new surroundings, a marrying of styles, um, you know, full of color um, and it's, the motivation also changed because you know now we have native peoples that are trying to um, you know figure out a way of sustaining and making it in this new world with you know European settlers and so um, as these these traditional items of the native people became items of interest to the Europeans they were now being made in order to sell um, to the Europeans and then also, you know, traded um, and taken back to the old world. So it, it became like a, a commodity item for them as a means of, of survival. This next image is um, 164 titled Transformation Masks. And again, we're going to be kind of all over that North American region now. Um, <clears throat> this is from the Kwakiuti Kwa Kwa tribe from Northwest Canadian. So we now we're in the Northwest um, region of North America and still in that late 19th, 19th century. And we're looking at masks that are made from wood, carved from wood and painted. And what we have here are these traditional ceremonial masks that were worn by the Pacific Northwest native people um, on their head, but then also accompanied a, a full body costume. And it was worn for a specific ceremony, uh, a performance actually called the potlatch. And what happened during this, um, this performance ceremony is the wearer of these masks <clears throat> would open on the exterior it was always some sort of animal mask but then by pulling of the strings the mask would open and reveal another mask on the inside that um, was more of a human form a human face um, at that moment of transformation the performer would um, turn his back to the audience to conceal the action um, and heighten up the mystery and then um, 
you know, turn around and open up the mask to reveal the face beneath. Um, the, <clears throat> the people that were allowed to wear these masks and do these performances were people of only a certain status, people of almost like shamanistic value. Um, shamanism being um, certain people in the tribe that had the ability, the power, and the access to kind of communicate with spiritual beings or higher beings and almost act as like a liaison between this spirit world and this human world. Um, and so it was um, a very revered um, and careful ceremony that only certain people could do these performances. And part of why they, you know, only the certain trained could wear these masks and do these performances is because they believed that these ancestral spirits or entities um, and supernatural forces would literally embody the dancers as they did these performances. And so, you know, putting on these masks, um, you really do take that spirit into you and you had to be you know a specific and trained person to do that um it was always an animal mask on the outside because there are in our native um, cultures there are many many myths that relate moments of transformation um <clears throat> that would kind of take on this this trickster supernatural um so a trickster is somebody that would kind of um, was a god or a spirit or some sort of anthropomorphic animal who would behold a great degree of intellect or secret knowledge and they would use that intellect and knowledge to play tricks or otherwise disobey <clears throat> some of the norms and the normal rules of conventional behavior. And so they believed that that a lot of these tricksters would try to kind of um, present themselves during this, this transformation ceremony. And so again, you had to be highly trained in order to, to not be fooled or not be taken over by these tricksters. Um, on the next slide, again, so that you can really embody and understand the contextual and functional information of these images. This is a great video that actually shows um, this Native American potlatch ritual. So you can see um, what the ceremony looks like, how the dance looks like, how the mask is used, and um, really kind of get a, a better bearing of how um, this was important to their culture and again, part of their rituals, their belief systems and their ceremonies. Okay, image number 165, what we're looking at is hide of, of elk that has been painted. And um, we're attributing this to, um, to um, Katsiogo, because of the style of the artwork. We think that that is um, the artist responsible for this piece, um, but it's from the Easter Shoshone tribe. And um, this is in the white, present day Wyoming area. And the function of this hide was a robe and it would be worn kind of over one of the shoulders of a warrior figure within the tribe. And each one of these hides was customized specifically to that warrior. And it would highlight the kind of pictograms of um, characteristics of that warrior, deeds of this warrior, um, things that the warrior had accomplished and achieved. And these were all um, kind of recorded on this hide and celebrated. Um, it would also convey a lot of like biographical details about personal accomplishments, their battles, their heroism, hero, heroism and things like that. Um, men painted these hides in order to uh, narrate a, a specific um, event. And so 
um, and then these were dedicated to the specific warriors. Um, but again, as things changed and as European settlers came in, you know, a lot of these native practices um, were were dying out, mostly because they were, you know, restricted from um, being able to kind of practice their their native rituals, um, and so these traditional art forms that they had, you know, was part of their culture and their belief system for so many years, started to turn more into a means of survival and commodity. And so eventually these hides, because they weren't really allowed to be practiced in their culture anymore, it was illegal, um, they started kind of painting these hides for European and American markets. So the authenticity of these native artworks, you know, they were losing the authentic authenticity. And, and that's really what this little section is is trying to point out to you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> at this point, these pictures changed from, you know, being dedicated to a specific warrior, and they changed to just kind of being pictures that depicted, you know, traditional aspects of these cultures, of these plains people um, that became just nostalgic rather than practical anymore. Um, so they would make depictions such as a bison hunt with a bow and arrow, um, pictures that um, showed nomadic hunting. Um, and this is how they kind of transform their artisan skills to now meet the needs for selling them in a European market um, instead of, you know, traditional ritual and practice. Um, we're looking at a composition here that traditionally places forms in an active sequence around a given space. So we have a lot of separation between positive and negative space that they're kind of equally spaced out from each other. That's what they mean by the entire composition. Um, and that um, the other important thing that is noted on here, because you know they're just kind of depicting some of their cultural attributes, but in the center, we're looking at um, the sun dance. So the sun dance is a very important ceremony and ritual to the Shoshone, to the Shoshone, and um, it's being depicted specifically on this hide. So I know that AP wants you to be able to know what some of these rituals are um, on this specific hide. So this one is about the sun dance. And um, we're going to, see, you know, this is also about the bison hunt and that the bison are becoming extinct. And at around 1750, um, we know that um, horses became a common use and liberated uh, the Plains Indians. Um, and so we've got the integration of the horses and, um, and the sun dance traditionally was conducted around um, a sacrificial bison head. And that was outlawed by the U.S. government and, of course, viewed, well, all of their kind of, you know, native practices were views, viewed as a threat to order. Um, so if their ceremonial practices were not outlawed um, entirely, bits and pieces of their practices were outlawed and therefore already taking away the, the genuineness and the, um, you know, fidelity of their cultural worship. Um, so it was, it was just never the same. But in the sun dance itself, you have men that dance and sing and prepare a feast and drum and, you know, construct um, a large lodge for the ceremony. And so this is, again, what's being depicted in here. And um, you have a very, very large teepee that is constructed for this ceremony. This is an annual ceremony. And um, you have these tall poles 
that are kind of kind of like that that hinge that I showed you in the Mississippian art. You have tall wooden timbers and poles that are erected in a circular form for the ceremony. And these poles are, you know, so tall that they believe that they would reach the spirit world in the sky. And basically, the sun ceremony has a lot to do with kind of dancing around this timber structure and then eventually um, kind of um, performing and taking part. Some of, some of the men in the Shoshone tribe would take part in some um, body modifications during the sun ceremony. And it would include kind of... Um, piercing your body in the chest and in the back and um, being tied to these erected timbers. And it was basically about a, um, you know, mind over body experience. It was a transformation experience um, that was very distinct to their culture. And the slide before this one, which is why I skipped it, um, is showing some examples of the sun dance ceremony. Um, so these are just some illustrations, but also some photos of the piercing through the skin, um, tying the piercing to you know these con taller constructed poles, and then kind of. Um, you know, leaning backwards, tugging on the skin, basically allowing, you know, your endorphins to kick in. Um, it it kind of just gives you this spiritual out-of-body experience um, that was very important um, to kind of pay homage um, during the ceremony and to kind of reach that spirit world. Um, this video I have here is a wonderful ex explanation um, by the Native people themselves to what the Sundance ceremony means to them, um, how it was difficult to lose that heritage um, due to colonization, and how these tribes are really kind of struggling to, um, you know, refine and reinstate their Native heritage. Um, and so, Again, that's what this entire little portion of this chapter within this content area is all about. So it's important to understand that and to be able to discuss it, especially if it becomes an essay question. And then um, I do believe our last image here is image 166. We have a, a piece of pottery here. It's black on black a ceramic vessel. And it was the artists of Maria Martinez and Julian Martinez. Um, they, it is um, uh, Pueblo Native American. So this is in our um, Southwest territory of New Mexico. This is a mid 20th century. So um, we have actually, you know, a, a piece of pottery that was made in the 1900s um, and it's blackware ceramic. What we're looking at here is pottery that was constructed by hand, and then it's fired in a kind of a open fire pit. And all of the black that you see here is not come from a glaze or anything, but what it comes from is the smoke from the fire that is trapped into the body of the clay. And then the difference of the blacks, you know, kind of this like dark gray to the deeper black. The difference of that is just from uh, which areas have been polished opposed to the areas that have not been polished. So as you can see the way it reflects the light, the dark black areas are the highly polished areas and that's what gives it its sheen. Okay. What we are looking at here are um, Maria and Julian Martinez trying to um, kind of bring back traditional pottery of the Southwest. So um, they are considered, you know, more modern day artists, but they are working with ancient techniques and ancient forms to revitalize 
their culture and their heritage that has been lost through colonization. So this is a thousand year old tradition of pottery making from the Southwest region. Um, at the time of production, um, the pueblos were in a real decline. Modern life was definitely replacing traditional life and these, these traditional art forms were at risk for being completely lost. Um, so these artists and this artwork um, specifically sparked a revival of those Pueblo techniques. Um, they are a husband and wife team. Maria actually makes the form. She works with the clay um, and she has kind of developed and invented more shapes than, than the traditional Pueblos have used. So she has you know, kind of married and merged some of these modern shapes with this traditional form of building them. But then Julian was the one that would um, paint the pots and use this kind of ancient um, um, patterns that is also a revival of their culture. These repetition of patterns that um, happen are, you know, um, abstract, um, mythic figures and designs that were native to their peoples. And um, so Julian dealt with the surface while Maria dealt with construction of the forms. Um, for the Pueblos, working with clay was an absolute communal activity. Many people would you know, build these pots and then they would put them in a large, large, large communal pit fire where they all took turns um, stoking the fire and getting the fire to certain temperatures, making sure that they had fires that produced enough smoke um, for the, for the um, carbons to be trapped into the clay body. Um, so again, you know, we're looking at um, you know, Native people trying to kind of keep their heritage and their culture intact um, during a, a revival period um, in these um, in these American cultures. Um, the in terms of form, you know, talking about monochromatic color schemes, talking about the variety of surface, the contrast between highly polished and matte, um, being able to talk about patterns, repetition of pattern, talking about symmetry, um, being able to discuss, you know, that this is a modern form, but that um, these are all utilitarian vessels that the Pueblo Americans had. Um, you know, used to hold water, grain, foods, and things like that. Okay, and then that's our last image. So that ends the art of the Americas. Like I said, it's a it's a hefty um, content area, but it's broken down into so many um, different and specific kind of regions and areas. Um, but you know, really focusing more on on that context that function, it is, we're really going to be focusing heavily on the cultures of people and how these images display the cultures and the belief systems and the practices um, of certain communities. That's the heavy focus. Hopefully you are able to notice that and pull out a lot of that information.